I will be the moderator for today's discussion. So some housekeeping things first, uh, we will be recording this session. Only video of our official speakers will be included. Uh, EFF is dedicated to a harassment free experience for everyone. All, participa are, all participants are encouraged to view our full event expectations at EFF.org slash event expectations. I encourage you to join us in the official chat via Twitch at EFF.org slash livestream. For those using Privacy Badger, please be sure to enable chat on Twitch by shifting the embed.twitch.tv slider and reloading. Please feel free to drop your questions in chat throughout the program and our guests will answer as many as they can at the end. Thank you for, thank you all for joining EFF, uh, is EFF's Affecting Change, our new live stream series covering some of the biggest topics in digital and privacy, digital privacy and free speech. We're thrilled to see so many join us for our first of three interactive panel discussions this year. Be sure to check out the next two programs in August and October of this year. For over 30 years, EFF has been the leading nonprofit organization defending civil liberties in the digital world. We use the unique expertise of leading technologists, activists, and attorneys in our efforts to defend free speech online, fight illegal surveillance, advocate for users and innovators, and support freedom-enhancing technologies. The reason that we can do this work is because of the support from people like you. Consider donating today to help EFF in the fight to defend your digital freedoms at EFF.org slash effecting change. And with that, let me welcome our speakers. There we go. <laughs> They're loading. So first, uh, we have David Green, my colleague at EFF. He's a senior staff attorney and uh, EFF civil liberties director on the legal team. Uh, Mike Masnick, founder and editor of TechDirt. And Daphne Keller, director of the program on platform regulation at Stanford Cyber Policy Center. So today we're going to discuss three monumental decisions from the Supreme Court this year on social media and First Amendment rights. The first case is called Linky versus Free, which focuses on the government as social media user. The second case, or actually two cases, are the net choice cases against the states of Texas and Florida, which focus on the government as social media regulator. And then the final case is Murthy versus Missouri, which covers a little bit of both. So let me start off with you, David. Uh, can you uh, give us a brief summary of each case and what the core First Amendment uh, questions were? Yes, and um, uh, uh, very, very briefly. So Linky versus Freed, which we talk about as government as social media user, it addressed the question of when can a government official uh, block uh, a, someone from commenting, either delete comments or block someone's ability to either follow or comment on them. And the specific question that the Supreme Court was looking at really dealt with what mixed use social media accounts. So when a governmental official maybe has a pre-existing legacy account or has account that's separate from the account that is um, held, that is identified with their office, and they maybe use it for mixed purposes. They show their family photos and, they, uh, and, and vacation photos, and they also may use it for the operations of their office. When, does, uh, when do they have to comply with the First Amendment, which would limit their ability to block uh, comments or block users? So that was linky. The second case is the net choice cases deal with uh, two different state laws, a Florida and a Texas law, and they share in common the requirement that, uh, that large social media or large online services, including uh, social media platforms, are required to carry certain content or limited in their ability to moderate content. Uh, and in that case, the Florida law specifically limited their ability to uh, moderate content from candidates for political office and for what was called journalistic enterprises. The Texas law very uh, broadly uh, per, uh, limited their ability to, to moderate contests on the basis of viewpoint. The third case, uh, Murthy versus Missouri, is what we call the jawboning case. And this deals with um, when can, uh, at what point does government uh, violate the First Amendment when it urges or exhorts or it, uh, encourages uh, a social media platform to moderate content, to either take it down or to deamplify something or to try to obscure it? 
Um, and so those are the three cases that, that the Supreme Court recently ruled on. Great. Thanks, David. So let's first dive into Linky versus Freed. And Mike, I'm going to kick it over to you sure. to go into a little more detail. Can you explain what the uh, practical problem was in that case? So we know that folks in government use social media all the time. But what was the specific issue um, in Linky and sort of how widespread is that problem? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of an interesting kind of new challenge created by the nature of social media and the internet. You know, historically, if a politician were hosting some sort of public event, uh, you know, uh, and rented out a, you know, a, a hall or, a, you know, a venue, they couldn't restrict certain people based on that they don't like their viewpoint. So if you're creating a public forum, you have it has to be public. Uh, otherwise, you're you're violating First Amendment rights by uh, you know limiting people and limiting people to access based on on their speech. And so that that was sort of that's somewhat understood. But when you get to the social media space, it becomes somewhat tricky because a lot of people politicians included, have social media accounts that may or may not be connected to their official position as a politician. And we all know that social media, it's a, a very important function and feature of social media is to be able to block and to mute other folks who are, you know, perhaps trollish or problematic or harassing or whatever it might be. But that creates a very weird scenario where a politician may be using their what seems like a personal social media account to discuss public official business of you know being an elected official and yet if they're using the block functionality to you know to limit someone perhaps they don't like what they're saying or they felt the person was being harassing is that the same thing as keeping them out of a venue that they rented and created a, a public forum in and so that was the main issue. And it's just sort of this thing that came up because of the nature of how social media actually works and the ways that people use social media and the the overlap between using social media for pr purely personal reasons and using them for professional reasons as a politician. And I think it's it somewhat widespread in that lots of politicians, you know, use their personal accounts for, you know, for building up uh, a community and interest. And sometimes they'll have multiple accounts, but it's pretty typical to use their personal account to, to talk about politics and, and policy and various issues. And then if they face harassment to think about using the block feature. Thanks, Mike. So uh, David, we're gonna get into the, the sort of legal weeds a little bit here, but um, in Linky, the Supreme Court uh, came up with a two-part, quote, state action test to determine if a particular social media post was government speech. So it was by a government official, but was it considered government speech for the first for the purposes of the First Amendment? Um, and if so, then the First Amendment generally prohibits censorship by deleting, as Mike said, deleting or blocking users' comments. But if you're a social media user and you have been censored by a government official on their um, social media account, do you have any recourse? I mean, that is, you know, how difficult do you think it will be for plaintiffs moving forward to uh, meet the, the requirements of the new Supreme Court test. Yeah, you, you do have recourse, but you're going to have to prove that this was actually a government function, that the, the interactive space of the government officials account was actually a government function, not their personal function. And what the and prior to the Supreme Court opinion, courts looking at that question really focused on the trappings of the social media account. Like, is it ident does the person identify themselves as a government official? You know, how frequently do they do they post what seems to be you know the, the them conducting the the business of the office? And and what the Supreme Court said was there's actually a step before that, before you look at the the trappings of the the account and how it's used you also have to answer this this preliminary question is does this government official actually have the authority to speak on behalf of the government do that is this is part of their job actually speaking to the public and if it's not then you don't even have to get to the second part and and so th that's that's the um that's what the supreme court added i don't think that i think in many cases that's not going to be difficult especially when we're dealing with 
high ranking government officials who it's you know, very obvious and very traditional that one of the things they do is address the public. And they may do this in a lot of different forms with press conferences or they might issue statements or they might talk to the press all the time. Um, and so I think with high ranking officials, this really will not be a major obstacle. It might be more difficult on the local governmental level um, where you have someone who's maybe the head of a department that doesn't really have a public facing role. And, and that that's potentially significant because these there's a ton of these cases in the courts and a lot of them actually do arise at the local governmental level. And in, indeed, the, the, the Supreme Court cases that the two cases that the court considered were one was a school board and one was a, was a appointed city manager. And so and so that is potentially an obstacle for people when you're when the official is someone who doesn't sort of obviously have a public facing uh, a public facing role. I, just one other thing that I think is important that the Supreme Court said, which really other courts had not done before, is they also said this can vary post by post. You know, if someone has the authority to speak on behalf of the government, then uh, you then you looked when they're whether they're exercising authority on a post by post basis, not necessarily their entire account. So if they have a mixed use account where they do business and they also do personal stuff, it's possible that the First Amendment could limit their ability to block a, or to, you know, to delete a comment um, to one post, you know, to their official, to the, you know, the government business post, but they're still free to you know, delete comments to the photos of their vacation. Right. And Daphne and Mike, do you all want to add anything on, on Linky versus Free? I think, think yep. David got everything. <laughs> Great. Thank you, David. Okay. So we will move on to the net choice cases against uh, Texas and Florida. So uh, Daphne, I'll start with you. In these cases, the states were concerned that the social media companies, the big social media companies, in, this, in particular YouTube and um, and Facebook, were censoring conservative voices. And so the states uh, passed legislation to tell the social media companies what content they must host, as in they shouldn't be taking down conservative content. Um, so what did the Supreme Court say about that? So the majority opinion basically said two things. One was they said, we're not going to strike down this whole law because we think it has applications way beyond what anybody explained in the briefs. We don't understand how it might apply to Venmo, how it might apply to DMs. And so they declined to strike down the whole thing. But equally importantly, the majority opinion goes into great detail explaining why if what we're talking about is the Facebook news feed or what, what it calls the news feeds ilk, sort of core social media function. If we're talking about that, the operators have a First Amendment right to set their own rules. They do act as editors. They can moderate the content as they see fit. They can prohibit particular content. It doesn't matter if they let most of the content come through, but just have some rules restricting it. It doesn't matter if they are using automated systems designed to enforce the rules or to prioritize news, you know, the ranking uh, based on those rules and preferences, all of that is First Amendment protected activity and the state can't come in and tell platforms they have to change it and, and host different things. And that's something that I think was actually obviously true all along. Like We've spent a few years in this expensive and time-consuming legal detour into entertaining the idea that some the law might say something else. Um, but I, I don't think that most constitutional lawyers are really very surprised by this outcome because we had tons of precedent about things like parade operators and cable companies and, and so forth that reinforced the idea that platforms do have this right. Right. So, uh, David, as Daphne said, the uh, Supreme Court actually declined to strike down both laws in their entirety. Uh, Net Choice brought what are called facial challenges, and the court said, okay, well, we're going to focus on um, YouTube and Facebook's news feed, but we don't know what other uh, applications are relevant here. So, really, uh, why did the court do that, and what's the significance of that, or declining to do that, I should say, striking down the laws as a whole? Yeah, and and I I should say before I mean this and this is a bit of a sort of legal procedural mess and everything I, and it shouldn't take away from how important the First Amendment holding uh, that Daffy talked about was but basically you know generally under the law is that you can't completely strike a law down 
um, unless it has no uh, constitutional applications at all. Under the First Amendment, there's an exception to that rule that says that, well, you can strike a law down that violates the First Amendment if um, if it's unconstitutional applications at sort of uh, substantially outweigh the constitutional ones. Um, and so and, and that's what the court was looking at here. And here it found it didn't make a it didn't decide whether or not this was an improper facial challenge. It just it said that the, the trial courts, uh, neither the trial courts or the appellate courts that are considered this, had actually asked the question whether or not this was a proper facial challenge. They hadn't gone through this process of identifying the constitutional applications and weighing them against the unconstitutional application. So it sent the cases back to the lower courts uh, to do that. And I think they were really motivated in doing that by the Florida law, which applies to a much wider variety of online services than the Texas law does. And the court, even in its questioning during the argument and, and in the opinion itself, talked about like, yes, we this might be unconstitutional as applied to Facebook newsfeed, YouTube homepage, and their ilk. I think they might have also called them heartland applications. And, and I, I think we can really think that really applies to social media as we sort of generally think of of the term that that it were decisions are made according to a set of community standards and and things like that. But the Florida law was written so broadly to apply to online services that it could also apply to messaging, to e-commerce. Uh, to event uh, management sites, even to different services within the internet stack. Um, and, and so at each, the law might apply differently to each of those things. Like there might not be the same First Amendment right. And so it asked the trial courts to look to, to look at that question. And, and that I think might be a problem for actually overturning the Florida law. And in some ways that creates a sort of perverse incentive for legislatures to write laws that you know, broadly applied a ton of different services, even if they only intend to apply them, you know, uh, apply them to, to, a, to a narrow category. The Texas law, I think, is more limited. And my guess is that I don't think this will be an obstacle to striking, ultimately striking down the Texas law, although the, uh, you know, the appellate court there is... Um, <laughs> has been weird uh, about, about these cases and was sharply criticized for the Supreme Court for being very wrong the first time. Yeah. I mean, just to jump in, I, I do think there's a real sort of practical and policy question here. Like, can states just pass a giant incoherent mess of a law like the one in Florida and then make it so you can't get rid of it in one blow with a First Amendment case and you have to have endless iterations of cases. In oral arguments, Justice Sotomayor was worried about that, and, and rightly so, and I, I wish that had surfaced more in the opinion, because this does leave lawyers kind of scratching our heads and worrying a little bit about how this is all going to work. And and just to throw in there, you know, we're already seeing some of that mess show up. I mean, there was just yesterday, there was a hearing in the Ninth Circuit uh, challenging, well, there were two hearings challenging California laws, and the ruling in, in the Moody case came up in in both of those and the discussions where the the judges on the ninth circuit were saying under moody do we have to go through this whole complicated process that the supreme court seemed to say that we have to have to now go through to analyze these laws great so l let's go back to the, actually the really good first amendment part of this case, <laughs> um which again is that uh at least the the big social media companies um uh, have a First Amendment right to sort of curate and moderate content, um, even if it's other part, other users' content, like third-party content, right? So that, that 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 compilation or that curation is itself an expressive activity that is protected by the First Amendment. But I thought one interesting wrinkle in the majority opinion, and actually Justice Barrett and her concurrence also suggested this, that automated content moderation using algorithms might actually not be uh, protected by the First Amendment if the algorithm is not acting pursuant to the company's own content policies and community standards, and is instead just um, reacting to users' dem demonstrated preferences. So in other words, uh, Justice Kagan, the majority, was really focusing on that that uh, that First Amendment right to curate um, is is seems to have been hinging on the fact that the curation was pursuant to the company's own content policies. And so really 
for any of the panelists, I mean, does this make sense? Is, would this be an appropriate limitation to the First Amendment right of editorial discretion? That is, if an algorithm wasn't explicitly um, sort of enforcing a, a content policy? So I'll, I'll jump in on this. Um, first, I actually think it's a good thing that the court is being cautious and saying, look, there are some questions we can't answer yet, and here's one of them. So I'm I'm perfectly happy that that's in there. However, I think if that were actually litigated, and speaking as a former lawyer for Google Web Search and in full disclosure, like I think that even if what an algorithm is doing is just trying to give users what they want with like no overlay of content preferences from the platform, there's still this tremendous amount of human thought and coding and decision making and competing versions of how you approach that going on all of which I think does fit within what the Supreme Court has has considered or what courts have considered to be protected before. And that there are a handful of cases about Google web search that, that say this for search ranking and that also would just proceed on the assumption that the goal is to give people what they want. David yeah, or Mike? I, I, well, I think that's right. And I, I think this was, you know, one of the night benefits of these cases is that um, the court seems to finally understand content moderation and how it works. And they're, they're not viewing social media as sort of passive, passive pipes, I pipes. think was the way it was referred to before, you know, where they just publish everything. And, and I, but I think we're seeing with algorithms and, and I really think the court is looking towards sort of a fear of AI, um, broadly defined as a scary term and they didn't want to go too far and say well if there's something there's this like this sort of semi-sentient ai tool that someone's using maybe there's no first amendment right attached so that, that, that's the way I, I think they have a concern for there may be some applications in the future and so we want to at least plan a stake in the ground that we're going to look at automated decision making maybe under a, a separate thing but I think the caveat, automated decision making not tied to a content policy, really, there's, I don't know if there's anything, that, <laughs> none of that's happening at all. It's almost all tied to a content policy. Well, it, it, I mean, it doesn't need to be though, right? I mean, you do have, have services that are popping up, especially some of the newer services that allow people to create their own algorithms and, and do things like that. And those algorithms then would not necessarily be tied to a content policy, though they might be tied to whoever created that algorithm's particular policy or the user's particular you know, stated policy. So there's some interesting applications of that that we'll see. But, I, but you know, going back to sort of the, the overall majority holding in 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 the in the moody case i you know i do think there was a lot of really good stuff for the first amendment in there um and you know one of the things that comes up that is i think uh, that that there's a little bit of tension that people who you know are strong believers in free speech sometimes find with with questions around content moderation is that often content moderation is about taking down speech and that makes people who are strong free speech supporters somewhat uncomfortable and there's this important recognition that there are multiple kinds of free speech interests at work here and and different speech interests and the platform being able to curate the kind of community that they want is actually really important to users free speech as well because if everyone were forced to have particular moderation policies, say the policies that the governor of Florida wanted them to have, you don't have the variety, you don't have differentiated communities. Whereas when platforms can create their own rules and then enforce them, you enable all those different communities to show up and that enables different types of speech to happen in different places and on different platforms. And effectively what this ruling says is that that is a First Amendment protected right and that platforms can create their policies and enforce those policies in a way that actually does enable more free speech, even if part of that is saying this kind of speech we don't want here. And this, I think, actually is one of the biggest missed opportunities of the ruling is it's so focused on the platform's editorial rights. But as Mike is saying, these laws had a huge impact on the rights of Internet users. And there was a great brief um, by Internet scholars building on work by James Brimmelman talking about users' rights as listeners in particular and how these laws would make it so that you can't just go read what you want to read and talk to who you want to talk to. You can only do that at the cost of having to look at a bunch of garbage that the state is 
is forcing you to look at or messages you're not interested in, but the state is forcing you to see. And that I think it would have been great if the state, if the court had talked just a little bit more about how users fit into this. Great. Anything else on net choice before we move on to Murthy? Great. Okay, so the final case is Murthy versus Missouri, and that case dealt with uh, allegations by the plaintiffs that the Biden administration put undue pressure on social media companies to censor user content that the officials believed uh, was misinformation related to COVID-19 and the 2020 election. So Daphne, going back to you, the court actually left the biggest First Amendment question unanswered. Uh, what was it? <laughs> well, the question is, supposing you can get into court and you do have standing to bring this case, when when do you win, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> when does the government actually violate the First Amendment through backroom conversations, pressuring platforms to take things down? Um, and we don't know the answer. I think it's good that we didn't get an answer in this case because the factual findings from the courts below in this case were so problematic and so unsupported by the record. Mike actually has a couple of great posts on this in Tech Dirt if people are interested in details on that. Um, but we don't know an answer to that. However, there was another case heard the same day called Vulo, um, which did yield some answers and does have some guidelines about when state actors overstepped the line. That was, it involved, a, in, uh, I think she's an insurance commissioner in New York who met with insurance companies and allegedly said things like, well, I could bring some charges against you about some kind of minor laws I don't usually enforce, but I won't if you stop doing business with the NRA. And allegedly this was because uh, she wanted to punish the NRA for their speech and advocacy. So that case does give us some guidelines about when informal state pressure where uh, state actors are overstepping the authority that they actually have uh, can violate the First Amendment. Um. Do you want to add anything to that, David? I know you have uh, thoughts. No, on that, that. That, that's okay. it. I mean, we were the. I know you're very disappointed that they didn't. Yeah, no. Do well, I, <laughs> there, it, it, I, I agree with Daphne, and we said, you know, EFF has actually been looking to bring cases like this for uh, for a long time, and we've had trouble finding a, a good case. And when this case came up, there was a bit of a concern because the facts are, it's it's based on sort of a sprawling conspiracy theory and. And there's a lot of and to sift through what is you know, what have, might have been um, sort of valid complaints from the non-valid ones is really, really hard. And it was it ended up being really hard for the courts. And as a result of that, we got we got some really bad decisions leading up to the Supreme Court decision. I, I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I was just going to say really quickly, I'm not sure it was hard for the courts. I think they they agreed with the conspiracy theories and jumped to things that were not true, which which made it problematic. Yeah, that, that was that, easy and fun, probably. <laughs> <the courts. laughs> uh, and, and the question we really wanted answered was, you know, when does government interaction become coercive? Like, what's the line between per permissible persuasion? Um, an exhortation, and when does that cross the First Amendment line into impermissible, impermissible coercion? And we didn't get that in the context of these facts, and I think that might be okay. What we did get was, as Daphne said, this is about with a very limited uh, holding on standing, and standing is who has the who can show that they've been uh, they've been injured, that the injured was caused by the governmental action. And that the court can actually give the court can actually fix it. They can they can make them whole again after the injury. You have to prove those three things to have standing. And and um, what the court said about standing, I think, tells us a bit about how narrow the court views who actually is injured uh, by by jawboning. And the court said that I mean, one of the challenges with content moderation, and, and I think this is correct, is that the platforms make a ton of these decisions independently. Um, and they they consult a lot of sort they consult a lot of sources they may consult they have internal experts they have outside experts they might consider the government experts they get comments from the government their users can report content there's a ton of inputs and they make their own they make their own decisions and then someone to win a lawsuit has to show that the decision was not actually the platform's decision it was the government's decision that was imposed upon uh, the platform and that can be that can be difficult to show. I think the other thing that I think narrowed these 
types of actions more than maybe had they been before is that you also have to show what the court said is that there was that the government wanted a specific post taken down and then that specific post was taken down and the person who authored that post um, if they can show it will happen again <laughs> or there's ongoing like they might be able to win a lawsuit if they can have damages then that actually makes it easier for them but if they want to get the court to order the government to stop they're going to have to also show that it's ongoing conduct and can happen again and i think that type of very particular we want your post taken down is is actually quite difficult to prove and i would hope that as these cases move along we'll we'll see that that also will apply to sort of if there is truly coercive government action that applies to a general category of statements that someone whose speech is clearly within that category and they can prove that they wouldn't have been taken down but for the government's action i would hope that they'd be able to have they would have standing to bring a case also so mike does, let's think about the practical uh sort sure. of benefits or or at least out you know outcomes of this case so as david said you know i mean EFF generally we're pro pro speech and we don't want people's content being taken down. But what might be the the benefit or the practical benefit of uh, perhaps allowing the government to have a have a wider berth to work with social media companies around national issues? Maybe yeah. what was the court thinking? Yeah. And so this is a tricky one too, because like I have spent years, decades, you know, being concerned about government overreach in terms of pressuring companies and their speech. And so my natural inclination was, was to be on the other side of, of this case, but the, the, you know, and I think, you know, it's similar to the way EFF feels, but this case was, was such a mess because there are things that are not coercive and that are not trying to, to pull down speech where the government should be able to speak to companies as well. And sort of, you know, the classic examples of that are, you know, cybersecurity concerns. If there are concerns about, uh, you know, there's there's a, a vulnerability and they want to share that information with technology companies to help them, you know, know and patch that vulnerability. Or when it comes to speech, if there are something, some important, valuable information that, that the uh, that a government official can share, such as, you know, attempts of foreign influence on an election or more specifically fraud examples of, you know, uh, pushing fraud or in the election context, telling people to vote on the wrong day. These are the kinds of things that uh, a government might, you know, have information on that would be useful for the platforms to understand the context in which they're making a decision, as long as it doesn't come with any sort of coercion, which is saying, you have to take this down, you must take this down, or else we are going to punish you in some way. That seems like useful government speech that, you know, in some ways is no different than anyone you know, most of the most platforms have a, a feature that allows people to report stuff and say, this is a problem, this is fraud, this is misleading or whatever. And then the platforms have their own right, as we discussed in uh, around the Moody case, to make a decision against their policies, whether or not it violates them, and then how to deal with that situation. So there is some sort of speech that should be allowed where we have to be concerned is when it, it goes across the line. And the problem that we've had for decades is that we haven't had a really clear test, which is what Daphne was talking about and understanding, you know, when is it that the, the government crosses the line? And so it would be nice and it would have been nice if the Supreme Court had given us a really clear test. You know, these three things could tell you whether or not it's crossed the line. But, you know, the ability for the government to speak itself and to share information that is important for platforms to know, I think is important. And where we might have ended up if the if the uh, Supreme Court hadn't come down where it was and where some of the lower courts came down was it would prevent the government even from sharing that kind of information, just contextual information, useful information, information that the government has access to that is important information for the platforms to know in order to make those decisions, that would have been barred. And I think that would have been problematic. And I think especially, I mean, COVID. That was sort yes. of a yeah, century, I mean, we didn't even, even get into COVID. Century situation. And, and of course, right, there's there are concerns back and forth there, right? Because you still, you know, there, there was a lot of misinformation and false information that went around around COVID. And some of it was well-meaning, but false information. Some of it was, we don't know what's going on and things are changing really quickly. But also, you know, the platforms themselves at certain points effectively said, we don't know what's going on. We're certainly not 
public health experts. And so we're going to look to, say, the CDC for information, and we're going to base some of our decisions off of the CDC. And that raises some questions, because you don't want the CDC determining what it is that people can say. The CDC is going to make some mistakes, and they did make some mistakes. But the question is, is it a situation where a platform is saying, the CDC is going to know better than us. We're going to just follow what they say. Or is it a position where the CDC is saying, "You, this is bad. You have to take this down. The latter situation, I think, is bad and problematic. And I think all of us agree that that is problematic. The problem is that it was more of a situation where the CDC was saying, this is what we think. And platforms saying, OK, we're going to sort of follow what you think because that's the best information that we have. And people in some people who were affected by that or having their speech affected by that, interpreting that as the other one, where the CDC is saying, this is horrible, you have to take it down, which would be a First Amendment problem. And so understanding that nuance and that sort of fine line is really important. And so far, the Supreme Court seems to have recognized that, though we'll see. Th this issue is going to come back. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, you know, definitely could. I, I would add, I think an important thing in both Murthy and Net Choice is, is to step back from the present day politics of it, because right this second, the left right alignment on these cases is honestly a little weird, right? Like in <laughs> Net Choice, suddenly people on the left are very pro corporate speech, right? Like <laughs> we want platforms to be able to make these decisions. Um, and people on the right, many people on the right, are suddenly very pro-government control over speech <laughs> and stepping in and telling corporations what to say, which is not what the Republican position was on these questions back when it was about cable or about broadcast. You know, this is a real reversal of what we've had before. And who knows how this will play out in the future. But anyone could be on the receiving end of being silenced by a big platform and not being happy about it. That's not an innately right-wing issue. And similarly, with the, the so-called jawboning, the government strong-arming issue in Murthy, um, the plaintiffs there were on the political right in today's American politics, but that could play out differently. Before Murthy, the most important case internationally about this came out of Israel. It's called Adala. I have a couple of posts about it on uh, on Lawfare, um, and that was a case with from before the current conflict, but from Palestinian activists saying that Israeli government um, people had. Uh, coerced platforms into taking down the Palestinian activist lawful speech. Um, so, you know, the politics are very different there. In that case, the, the Israeli Supreme Court said, you can't prevail on this claim because number one, there's no proof any lawful speech was ever taken down because the government didn't keep any records and the users weren't notified when it was government initiative that their speech got taken down. And then secondly, it said, you can't prove that the platforms were coerced. And you know that's kind of weird because I can well imagine that the current present day platform people who've been enforcing their current policies for a number of years, they'd sign an affidavit saying we weren't coerced. This was our policy. We always wanted to take this stuff down when actually in many cases they're enforcing policies that were themselves created through government coercion over the course of years. So I, I think um, that case both stands for the, you know, this point about the there is no innate left-right alignment here, and also the problem with looking solely to coercion and to coercion within that one interaction with that one government body when actually platforms are being influenced by long-term discussions with governments around the world. And I think the plaintiffs did try to argue that, but the government wasn't persuaded. So, I mean, the court. Um, any final comments on either Murthy or all three cases? I can I can just say with Murthy, I and I that you know if I, to the extent that people, well, what are we supposed to do if we've been censored and it's so hard to prove the government did that? You know, can we sue the platforms? You know, we, um, I think that's that's probably not uh, uh we actually <laughs> CMF has a post that we wrote saying that where we we wrote filed amicus piece advocating for a very very narrow path where platforms themselves should actually be considered to be government actors under very limited circumstances um where they basically voluntarily ceded their decision making um to the to the government um but that that actually you know it has to be that has to be narrow because what we know from both 
mercy and net choice is that um, platforms have a First Amendment right to make these decisions, right? And so any private any private um, action against the platforms for making the decision is going to have to um, is going to have to you know, find a place where the platforms were not exercising their own First Amendment rights. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. That's uh, that's the, the the heart of our discussion. We'd love to uh, move on to Q and A now. So, I think we already have some questions. Um, I'll just start from the top. Um, do you think that Florida and Texas knew they were doomed to failure, but were just trying to move the Overton window? If so, do you think they succeeded or did? Uh, did the Supreme Court success, successfully lock it in place? So I generally never try to guess what le why any particular legislator does anything or think that they all have the same reason. But I did actually, during the oral argument in that choice, I actually sat next to the Texas, uh, uh, Texas uh, uh, legislator who wrote and sponsored the bill. And and talking to him then he really really thought he there was a huge problem of of conservative censorship uh by what he considered to be left-leaning social media platforms and he thought this was a common a common sense solution and he really viewed social media as being like like telephones and and so the, he so his, his personal view was that uh, that this was just the right this was just the right thing uh, the right this was just the, a, a thing to protect you know Texans who felt like they were being uh, you know, being censored by social media. Yeah, I, di I didn't see anything that indicated that the people who passed these laws did not believe that that they were legitimate laws. I, I think they they felt strongly that they would win. I'm going to dissent a little on that and say that I think the legislation was passed in a sort of climate of irrational exuberance. They were really <laughs> excited about it. They, particularly in Florida, were not taking the time to write a coherent law. And that could easily have been because they assumed they'd get struck down. But this was a really important political signaling moment for them. This is, this is when DeSantis was running for president. Um, you know, it, it, it was a moment where the signaling was important, regardless of what happened with the law. Okay, um, going to move down a little bit. Uh, so if uh, this, I think, goes to the Justice Barrett concurrence, if um, if what if giving people what they want is a platform content policy? So I guess relatedly, what about editorial discretion with respect to unprotected speech? Does that mean that platforms couldn't have an obligation to block or downrate downrank unprotected speech such as mal malware? copyright infringing content truth threats etc does this limit the kinds of laws that the government could pass to address misinformation or election interference well let's just i, I don't know maybe just start with the first part which is like there's a lot they want. yeah um is that is a platform content policy i don't know if, if you all want to elaborate on that i know we we did we did kind of talk about that a little bit but I mean, I think, and, and Daphne can probably speak to this, but like going back to the search engine cases, right? I mean, that's what search engines are, right? Search engines are supposed to be about giving people what, what they want. And that has generally been seen as as protected speech. Um, and so, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if it goes beyond that, but Daphne, do, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, also, <laughs> Cable programming is about giving people what they want. Sure. <laughs> like the New York Times story recommendations I get are about giving people what they want. Giving people what they want is a very common thing that editors and publishers do in the world. So isolating it as unprotected seems um, questionable. To the, the second part of the question, I'm actually really interested in this too, the sort of what does th this ruling tell us about laws where the requirement is for platforms to remove content or the urge <laughs> is to get them to remove content, whether or not the lawmakers quite have that authority. Um, and I, I think the, the simplest part is, you know, lawmakers can prohibit certain expression and nothing in net choice changes that, you know, the, the basic ability to regulate defamation, um, child abuse material, et cetera, is, is unchanged by this. 
And then the question of whether there are special constitutional rules when that obligation to police content or to remove content is placed on a technical intermediary when you're telling YouTube or Facebook or X to go out and enforce the rules. There are some really interesting constitutional questions about the limits there because we know that platforms will err on the side of taking down too much content and do so in a way probably with disparate impact on minority groups. Um, but that set of questions really wasn't raised in net choice. So I think that's still, you know, an, an open, open area. Yeah, and just to just to wrap it up, I think it, it's it's um, it's important to realize that the net choice cases and and Moody and sorry and Murphy also um, dealt with legal speech, dealt uh, all dealt with speech that's protected by the First Amendment. And th these cases would have been very different if all these were were enforcing existing laws with speech that the limited categories of speech that are not protected by the First Amendment. Yeah. Um... So, David, I think you touched upon this a little bit, but in terms of the Murthy case, if it's going to be hard to sue government officials for coercive platforms because there's this like three party, you know, chain of causation, um, is there anyone else a plaintiff could sue, such as the platforms directly, or sort of what's the viability of that? Yeah, and I, 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 I answered this before. It, there is, it, again, we, we have a blog post that you that we can you can look for, or if you have trouble finding it, reach out to me. I'll, I'll point you to it. Uh, that says we think there should be a narrow path, but the um, but the courts really haven't uh, completely answered that question. And I do think that it's 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 going to be very 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 difficult to do. Um. Great. Let's see. Um. Uh, let's see. Let's see the okay. So does the line between I think this is still related to Murphy, Murphy. Does the line between coercion and persuasion have anything to do with intent or the type of speech involved? Is there a difference between jawboning with respect to misinformation as opposed to speech critical of the government official? So, um, so to answer the second part, no. Uh, the, the subject matter doesn't matter at all. And I, I think that's correct. In terms of intent, that's a really good question. In our amicus brief in the Supreme Court, we had actually urged the court to adopt intent as one of the factors that, uh, some, that the court should consider in distinguishing between permissible and impermissible speech. Um, but again, the court didn't, in, at least in Murthy, didn't tell us, didn't give us a list of factors. Um, and, and it wasn't really an issue in Volo either. So I don't think we, I mean, in Volo there was intent, but the, um, and it was very clear intent, um, but the, the court didn't lay it out in a way. I, I, so I still, I, I, I still, I, I still think it's a highly relevant factor, but we didn't have the court do what Come I think would have been test. really helpful and say, factor one intent. <laughs> we didn't get that. And I, th I think one of the biggest through lines in looking at these cases is whether the government is transparent to the public in its actions, right? Are we talking about Biden giving a speech and calling for platforms to do what he thinks is their moral duty? That's the kind of thing that we expect politicians to do. And the gov we have a mechanism to hold them accountable if the government, if the, you know, the voters don't agree. Um, or are we talking about a backroom communication that nobody in the public knows about? And that might be a signal about the intent or a signal about how the platforms receive it or a signal about how coercive it might be. So the, the sort of public knowledge and transparency is a really important theme in these cases. And I'll do, let's see, one more. Um, actually, there was a question about transparency, so that's that's good. Um, so again, I think we talked, we touched on this briefly, but um, if there's this open question about whether automated content rank, content ranking ranking or filtering or curation isn't protected, um, I think this person means pursuant to uh, because it's not pursuant to a content policy. Does what does that tell us about AI um, and content moderation? I, I think the court is leaving open. I, I think it tells us that the court is holding judgment on what this means about AI. And and, and also um, also lets us know that the court doesn't know exactly what AI, doesn't have a grasp of it and didn't feel confident, but they know it's a thing out there that's going to come up in front of them at some point in the future. 
And so they don't want to commit, they want to leave open the possibility that there will be different rules. Great. And like Justice Barrett in her concurrence seemed to imagine a kind of AI that polices hate speech yet was not trained by humans on data sets, you know, with humans and uh, adding their own concept of what hate speech is into the system. That's not really a thing, but, you know, hypothetically, if it were, I guess it's good the court didn't address it yet. So in short, much to be determined uh, on this on all of these issues in the in the coming years. Okay, well, we have to wrap. Thank you to all of our panelists. What a great conversation we had. Um, and thanks to everyone who contributed to the discussion in the chat with the great questions and all of you watching. Um, so our movement to protect digital rights and freedoms begins with you all. Um, those of you who joined us today, EFF has been at the forefront of the movement for privacy, freedom of expression and innovation for 34 years, actually this month. And we need your help to keep up the fight. So uh, we encourage you to become a member today at EFF.org slash Effecting Change. And we hope you will continue these conversations about your civil liberties with your colleagues and friends. We will see you at our ne next Effecting Change live, stream, uh, live streams. And the first one will be, re or the next one I should say, will be re reproductive justice in the digital age. That's on August 28th. And then how to prote protest with privacy in mind on October 17th. And to find out more about our live stream series, go to EFF.org Effecting Change Series. So the first one is to donate, and the second one is to see uh, Effecting Change Series is to see um, our schedule. So again, thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you all next time. <laughs>